So hello again, my, my name is Kyle. Uh, I'm a principal at DCM Ventures. We're a $4 billion cross-border US-Asia fund. Um, and here with me today uh, are three uh, exciting panelists uh, who do uh, varying uh, international investments. I'm going to hand it off to them to do a quick intro. So uh, name, uh, a little bit about your firm, and then your favorite international investment or company, international company that you're tracking. Cool. So I'm Kobe Fuller. I'm partner at Upfront Ventures. We're the largest uh, Series A and seed fund uh, based in Los Angeles. Um, excited to be here and uh, lend whatever wisdom I have. Um, hopefully it's enough around international investing. And um, so I've been investing since 2003 and uh, been at a number of firms over my career, um, Inside Venture Partners, OpenView, Excel, and now most recently uh, Upfront. And um, yeah, I spend time both on enterprise software investing as well as uh, consumer tech, consumer internet. And interesting investments, a couple uh, international ones we've done, we called Infosum, it's based uh, right outside London, it's a marketing uh, data platform that's trying to uh, reinvent the way people actually kind of store their own first party and third party data and share with others. Uh, so a former founder that we backed before um, named Nick Halstead from Datasift. Uh, and there's another one, unfortunately I can't talk about, but it's based in Paris that we just closed and are going to announce soon that's kind of in the um, mobility space that's uh, kind of complementary to um, you know, Bird and Lime and others. Great. Okay. Uh, Ho Nam from Altos Ventures. Uh, we started in Silicon Valley in 96, and I got started in my venture career in 1990 at a firm called Trinity Ventures. Um, and I remember like 1991, that year, the entire industry raised $1 billion. It was a recession year. And, and we've come a long ways. I mean, we've had rounds where one investor in a single round might invest a billion dollars. So things are very different. We started doing international investing in about 2006. I made our first international investment in South Korea. Since then, we've had four different unicorns come out of South Korea alone. We've also invested in uh, various countries in Europe, Eastern Europe especially, Estonia, uh, Belarus, uh, and Ukraine have been countries we've invested in. We probably have, our companies collectively have, we stopped counting, over, well over 15,000 employees outside of the US. So we definitely see lots of activity outside the US. Silicon Valley is a mindset, not a place. And so we're excited to talk about this topic. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Nina Ashadian. I work at Index Ventures. Super excited to be here tonight. Um, I started my career on Wall Street and then went over to Google to get some operating experience and then actually started a fund that invests in Armenian founders, so very excited about investing in international founders. And I joined Index about a year and a half ago. Index is truly a global firm. We have offices in London, Geneva, and San Francisco, and half of our portfolio, if not more, are based outside of the U.S. We only opened an SF presence about eight years ago. Um, and we do everything from seed all the way through growth. I focus a lot on vertical SaaS and also enterprise SaaS. And in terms of my favorite international company, I'm really excited about this company called Cree, which is based in Sweden. They're basically democratizing access to healthcare and have figured out the right way to do telemedicine. So we're really excited about that. Great. So for, for I guess, um, all of you, you're, you're very, three very distinct firms. Can you talk a little bit about your firm's strategy for investing internationally and what you, know, you find unique about that? So we actually have one team, one investment team across both geographies and our, both our venture fund and growth fund are across both. So we actually, every US deal that we do, we get input from the European team and vice versa. So we're constantly thinking about you know, the global entrepreneurship environment. And one of the things that we've truly been able to do is master a playbook on if you're in Europe, how you build an office in, in the US and vice versa, so. Yeah, I'd say for um, some of the platforms we work for historically, so there's like Excel, for instance, you have Excel London, you have Excel India, and then I worked at the Palo Alto office. Um, and we had uh, both a growth fund and early stage fund. So a platform like that, it's really easy to um, really leverage um, multiple partners across the world to really have insights around some local geographies and be smart about deploying capital even though we're here in the Bay Area. Um, or say, 
early than that was an insight where, you know, really late stage growth investors, that was one where if we're going to deploy, call it $50, $100 million in a given business, you'd hunt the best deal regardless of location and just hop on a plane to, uh, you know, generate a return of that magnitude if you're putting in that much capital work. And up front being sort of series A and C based solely in LA, it's definitely a lot more difficult to be able to hunt outside of your own backyard. And the way we kind of think about investing internationally is one, just having conviction around you know, founders and product markets, just like we would any company that we put money in. Um, two, we try to leverage some sort of expertise that uh, any one of the individual partners may have. So one of our founding partners, um, Eve, is from Paris, and he really takes time to dominate that market with the network he has. So even though it may be an early stage deal, he'll be able to tease out the best company in Paris and deploy capital in there. And for any other partner that wants to actually take the time to hop on a plane and do a deal that's outside of LA, a lot of it is just you know, our time. Do we want to use it in a way where instead of actually traveling down the street, we're gonna be you know, heading on over to uh, you know, a foreign country to play capital? So it really comes down to conviction and how excited you are for a deal to work with a business and really sort of um, you know, have that be in the portfolio. And sometimes as well, you can bring some of those companies um, you know, over here as well. Uh, but there's certain cases where uh, it doesn't make sense to keep that company in uh, you know, its, its current country, for instance, Infosum, which is one of the deals we did. So I think it's, uh, it varies based off of maturity of platform and, uh, and also this conviction of each individual partner to actually want to spend their time to actually go and do an international deal. You know, in, in the old days, <laughs> right, the rule of thumb was, well, you, you have to be able to drive. Like East Bay was like a foreign country, right? Like the industry has changed a lot. And I, I would say I like deals outside of Silicon Valley and not just international. So we've done deals in New Orleans, Denver, Austin, Vancouver, Canada, Portland, Oregon, LA. And the, the characteristic that I see of companies outside of Silicon Valley, outside of our little bubble here, and internationally especially, is there's not the kind of massive amounts of capital you see here, with the exception of, I would say, China. So we don't do China. We don't do India. We go, we like to, and, and we don't do Israel either. So we like to go to places where you don't have a whole lot of VCs chasing deals. And, and in those kinds of environments, and it could be New Orleans, not just international, entrepreneurs are very pragmatic. They're very focused not on fundraising, right, and impressing investors at pitch events. They're very focused on their customers and very focused on figuring out how to make money. Because if you don't make money, you go out of business. That's sort of how the world operates outside of our little bubble, right? So I like working with entrepreneurs who understand how the world operates and try to build a real business and address the needs of customers. And it's very refreshing. We could actually have real conversations. So yeah, that's one of the reasons we like international deals. So it sounds like, is this working? It, it sounds like uh, Index, very cross-border between US and Europe. They have a big team in both markets uh, for upfront, uh, very much dependent. Partners are allowed to invest basically anywhere, but the bar is probably higher to go uh, internationally, uh, just given uh, the tax on time. And then for Ho, uh, it sounds like uh, Altus is very open to investing, not just internationally, but really just out of, outside of the Bay Area. And actually, you guys like investing outside the Bay Area, it sounds like. Um, and then for just perspective on DCM, we're also very cross-border, uh, but between the US and Asia. So primarily, uh, primarily actually US and China, the two kind of large markets and have large on the ground team uh, there. And also all investment decisions are made Jointly, similar to uh, similar to index. But going going back to um, you know uh, Kobe and and Ho, your your firms are very much U.S. based. Um, how do you think about sourcing deals internationally? You know, if you do, or how do you think about accessing international deal flow? Yeah, I think um, I'll do it two ways. Well, one, I mean, I kind of source them like any deal, uh, regardless of location. So. You know, one way in which I look at opportunities is by taking just a sector focus. And I have a thesis on a category, and I'll find the best company regardless of location where it exists. And if it happens to be 
outside of the US, then the bar has to be a little bit higher in terms of me actually wanting to deploy capital into that business. But that's one way in terms of sourcing deals. The second is um, having trusted um, upstream investors that I can talk to that are feet on the street that are either you know, local angels or seed investors that have you know, cherry picked the best companies in their region that then you know, I can trust their filter and have that be my way in which into looking into those markets. So for me, like, those are kind of two of the main areas how I kind of you know, source international deal flow. Yeah, what, what, what we found is when we hunt for these deals in these underserved regions, when we do a deal, it's usually a headline event because it's like, oh, some Silicon Valley investor invested in our city, so a company in our city or in our region. So that you, entrepreneur usually gets some press and gets a lot of people like, how did you do it? How did you do it? And, and, and that is the beginnings, and if, especially if that company is successful, of more deal flow coming from that particular region. And it's just one deal at a time. When we first went to Korea, I think we did one of our early deals with DCM, actually, uh, Pandora TV, which didn't work out that well, actually, but it's fine. Um, it, it, Not our fault. <laughs> you know, th that led to these relationships and more deals, and we didn't have an office for the first five years there. And um, we were meeting in cafes and hotel rooms, I mean, hotel lobbies, not rooms. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah, I know, these days you gotta be watch, watch, watch out for that kind of stuff. But, uh, uh, but that you know, led to more and more deals, uh, and, and it sort of builds on itself. You, you build uh, a network, you build reputation, you get to know who the key local, local players are, and it sort of mushroomed, and it, 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 was, it wasn't until we did nine deals in Korea that we decided to have a separate fund. We operated as a single team with multiple funds, depending on, you know, we are, we're act, operating 10 different active funds right now, so we always have lots of different funds, but it's a single team that makes all these investment decisions. Right. Um, so I, I do want to get to the, I have a number of questions for, uh, that pertain to the founders in the room, but before I get there, um, what is the most, or you can name more than one if you'd like, um, emerging market or international market? Like, what is the most exciting market that you find right now outside the U.S.? Well, I'm, I'm very biased because we have Korea funds, right? The reason I like that is it's a very small market to the outside world because uh, it's only 50 million people. And so people have no interest. They're flying over to China all the time, India, Brazil. Russia, Israel, no one's flying to Korea. But as it turns out, you know, when, when we first discovered our first company that became a unicorn, it's like, wow, maybe this is bigger than we had thought. And then, and then another one came, and another one came. And so what I like about that country is it's too small to get all these people hunting for deals there, yet it's big enough to build a multi-billion dollar company in a reasonable amount of time. So uh, I'm very biased in, on Korea. I mean, I, I still think that uh, Europe has just attracted so much talent, and it's really incredible to see. For Index this year, we had some of our biggest IPOs come out of Europe. Adyen, for example, iZettle, which was bought by PayPal, and a couple others. Um, and now we're starting to really think about, OK, you know, London and some of these centers attracted a lot of people to move there. And we're starting to trace back where those people come from. So we think like Eastern Europe is really, really, really interesting, Croatia, Ukraine. Um, and now that a lot of those companies, a lot of those um, individual engineers that have been successful working in city centers are actually moving home and starting their own companies. So those are areas that we're really excited about. I'll be honest, I, mean, I really don't have a favorite, I'd be honest. Um, but uh, just selfishly, I'd like to spend more time in Europe because it's a great part of the world. <laughs> And um, for me, um, you know, I still think there's an incredible opportunity in Asia, and particularly in, in China. We're just seeing some amazing opportunities there. Um, you know, 10 years ago, we would, uh, we would uh, bring international uh, US-based models to China. Nowadays, I'm going to China to learn about what's the late, what are the latest consumer internet trends there to bring here to the US. Um, so moving on, um, you know, there's a lot of founders in the room, uh, a lot of them uh, you know, potentially maybe international. At what point do you think it makes sense for a founder based in you know, Eastern Europe or uh, LATAM to move to Silicon Valley? And uh, you know, when does it make sense to, to stay in, in their home countries? Uh, 
You know, one of the, one of the things that uh, we always think about is how close are you to your customers and does your location lend itself to making your job as a salesperson or your sales team, um, you know, does it make their job easier or harder? So I think one of the things that you should definitely consider is where you are. Are you close enough where you can go to like trade shows or like interact with customers, meet your customers in person? I think that's really important. That doesn't mean you necessarily have to move to the United States. Uh, you know, obviously there's massive markets outside of the U.S., um, but what, that's one of the things I would certainly consider, especially if you're in the B2B space. Yeah, I think it's hard to do B2B. We've done a lot of consumer-oriented deals outside the U.S. It's hard to, harder to do B2B. I think you have to be here. But two B2B companies we've backed, one was in New Orleans and one is in um, Belarus, both of those entrepreneurs did very smart things. They came here, they, you know, they raised a little bit of money, but not that much, but they met a bunch of people got their email addresses, and they just sort of kept updating us, right? They did a really good job of, hey, this is what's going on, right? And, and every quarter, like clockwork, and we tracked both of those companies for about two years. And then, you know, coincidentally, of course, you know, it's like, hey, these guys are still around, they're still in business, and they're making progress. Of course, right around the time that I called the phone, it's like, hey, maybe we should meet again in person. Of course, everybody else called too. We were very fortunate we got both of those deals, but we tracked those deals over time, over two years, and, and so you don't have to be here in Silicon Valley. Like meet some people and then like, hey, give, you know, just keep focusing on your business. Make progress and people will like want to meet with you and they will fly over. I mean, I've, you know, like at, at Excel, right? those guys flew over to Australia, Atlassian, you know, like just to have lunch with them and then fly back to California. Yeah, like if you're doing well, people will come from all over the world to come to your home country, hometown to meet with you. Right. Generally, that happens when, I mean, Atlassian was already a massive company. Everybody wanted to invest. They were already profitable. What about the early stage founders in the room, you know, folks that are pre-Series B? Maybe they've raised money from a local VC. They may not have the networks that a homegrown Californian, you know, Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard alums may have. How do you, how do you, what advice do you have for them wanting to, you know, meet with with you guys um, when uh, they may not be, you know, from Silicon Valley or from California. I, I, our experience has been it's been very very difficult to get Silicon Valley investors to pay attention to our early stage companies that are abroad until they get to at least 300 million market cap. By the time they get to a billion dollar valuation, yeah, it's, it's obvious and people are flying in in their private jets to meet with the companies, right? <laughs> but until they get to a certain level, no. I mean, so we would have to fund it ourselves or work with the local ecosystem to get it to a certain level. And you know, we, we had one company that I think raised money from PayPal and Bessemer, and that was a kind of early, it was like 100, I don't know, 120 million pre or something. That was kind of an early, it was, it was, and it was hard raising that round. But that same company, by the time they got to a billion dollar valuation, it was like then they didn't have to travel here, right? People are flying there to meet the company. So it, it's, it's challenging. So I think you have to, look, there's no substitute for real market validation and traction. You gotta do it the hard way. I, I don't think there's any magic special like pitch you have to, special dance you do to convince people to invest in your little company before you've proven anything. Yeah, Not gonna think, happen. Yeah, I don't think it's any sort of like magic pitch thing like that, but like for me, I don't think it has to be a three hundred million dollar sort of like market business. If the company, say it's a SaaS company that has compelling sort of SaaS unit economics that's growing at like an absolute weed um, and I have the ability to have north of twenty percent ownership or better because maybe the terms are better because it's a European market and it's in a very, very attractive category, I'll, I'll totally hop on a plane almost anywhere to see that company. So I think it depends on investor around sort of again like are they okay investing their time to get on a plane and do they feel like that company will be a multi-billion dollar business? And that's kind of the hard part of this job is being able to predict like, yeah, like if it's a billion, multi-billion dollar business, yeah, I'll hop on a plane anywhere. Um, but having 20% ownership of that um, and seeing the exit there is like, that's, that's the risk that we take with our time. And then I think too, like going back to your, um, your question around, you know, when should entrepreneurs potentially move to Silicon Valley or not, I mean, even though it's not an international company, I think through sort of, you know, the story of Exact Target, which is a company I invested in early on in my career, Scott Dorsey and team 
like specifically built exact target in Indianapolis and had the option to move to Silicon Valley and intentionally did not want to because they wanted to invest back in the Indianapolis ecosystem. And you know, to this day, you know, they're building High Alpha, which is a venture studio that's investing back in Indianapolis. And it takes like entrepreneurs like that who want to see their home city become a tech hub to actually have you know, any city across the world to become the future tech hub. So I think if you actually have a passion around investing back in your local um, sort of region, that um, yeah, you're gonna have to probably hop on some planes to um, the US markets and others where your customers are, but if there's something bigger that's driving you around, driving an impact towards bringing entrepreneurship and tech to your local region, I think that's something you have to follow. Yeah, that's a really good point that's made because we see this differing patterns, even in the US, like San Diego has created huge amounts of entrepreneurial wealth, like Qualcomm, mostly in Qualcomm, and they did not reinvest back into the ecosystem for whatever reason. And in other cities, like Scott Dorsey doing it in Indianapolis, and we see it in other cities, for whatever reason, they set a culture, like the, the early winners invest back, and then it gets other people to do it, and it sort of creates a snowball effect. So we see it all the time. In certain regions, when we see that kind of activity, reinvestment back into the community, like, okay, that's an area that we start to pay more attention to, because we are betting that more activity is gonna come from that region. And so I hope you guys remember that, that when you guys, some of you guys are, are successful, please reinvest back in your community. And it, it, it creates huge benefits down the, down the road. I would just quickly add one more thing. I mean, if you think about it, all investors are searching for alpha, right? So if there's a hot company in San Francisco, chances are every single VC fund is like bidding up the valuation, which of course impacts returns. So we sit here and we think, well, where are the pockets that are being ignored or not on people's radars? And outside the United States is a perfect opportunity to look for those, you know, those investment, investment opportunities. But one of the things I would say is if you are pitching a US-based firm, honestly, it doesn't matter what stage you are, one thing I would try to articulate in your pitch is why you have an unfair competitive advantage from where you sit. So if you're in an area where you have access to incredible engineers at one one hundredth of the cost of what it takes to hire an engineer here, that's a competitive advantage. Or if you're the fastest growing startup in your ecosystem or in your you know, city and you can attract the best talent pretty quickly, that is a huge advantage. So make sure you think about that because those factors play a big decision, at least in, in our investment decision process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And just just um, switching gears just a little bit. Let, let's assume that um, you know the founders they they want to move to the U.S. and they made the commitment to move here. Um, Silicon Valley become very expensive. It's hard to hire here. Um, what are some other considerations for maybe moving to other other U.S. cities? Maybe L.A. for example. Well, I'm clearly biased. Um, moved to L.A. two years ago and. Yeah, LA, uh, even though it's, uh, it is still very expensive, it's slightly sort of you know, cheaper cost of living. What I love about LA is that um, there's an aspects around sort of the, the area that um, you can't find here in the Bay Area. One, it's you know, the epicenter of um, kind of media, entertainment, fashions, the creative class. So um, being able to sort of immerse yourself in that environment, if you even sort of remotely touching those categories, uh, I think it's a really, really exciting place to be. Um, and it's phenomenal weather. So. <laughs> and any other thoughts on maybe different, uh, when it makes sense to be maybe, you, well, you've chosen to move to the US but not be in the Valley? Yeah, well, what we've seen is when people move here, let's say, like the, the company in uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Estonia, they all moved here, but they all then kept an R&D operation right, overseas. And then, and then you, you have the R&D operation and then you start to hire some HR people, some finance people, some marketing people, some sales people, some BDRs, like all, because they're like cheaper. So you end up building operations, and even within the US, like the, the company I was thinking about in Belarus, I mean, we opened a Tampa, Florida office for sales, right? So, so there are ways that there's certain kind of talent you could uniquely, only uniquely get in Silicon Valley. So it makes sense to have a presence here but does not mean you have to have your entire company here. You could have it overseas, you could have it in different parts of the US. And so we're seeing this all the time. Even Silicon Valley companies that started here, like one, Cleveland, Ohio is one of the offices where we're like tripling down 
in our sales operations for one of our companies in SaaS. It's like it's it's great, you know. I think uh, you know, as an investor, you always want to be contrarian and take contrarian bets. And as entrepreneurs, probably the fact that you've you know turned down a great job to go out and build something makes probably means you have a contrarian view about how something should be built better. So you know, don't just go where people are going because that's like the next hub. Try to find the edge, whether it's Nashville, Atlanta, you know, Chicago. Uh, there's incredible places with a lot of talent. And there's some actually really cool startups that are working on developing both engineering and sales talent outside of the Bay Area. So I think we're going to see a lot more opportunities pop up. I, I found myself um, encouraging my portfolio companies to start a second office much sooner than before, whether it's an RD office or a sales office outside of the Valley, even if it's somewhere else in the US. Yeah. Um, so just, I just want to spend a few minutes on kind of tactical advice. So um, for the founders in the room, would love to hear things that, you know, approaches, tips for pitches that, that resonate or work for you, um, and things that are just, uh, you know, like either pet peeves or things that they really should avoid in their, in their presentations and meetings with you guys. Yeah, I mean, me personally, um, I'm pretty sort of like, low-key laid back, so I think a lot of the reason why I love this job is because I purely enjoy just being a part of the journey of building a company, um, and sort of like the derivative outcome is hopefully sort of like really great returns for you know our founders, um, our LPs, and for us as fund managers. And so a lot of that is being able to take the time to actually get to know the entrepreneurs and um, really treat the relationship like a partnership. Yeah, I think conversations I have with folks that are pitching me and it comes across very transactional, um, you know, I become sort of extremely allergic to it. It's just, it's not a comfortable experience. So, I mean, a lot of this sort of relationship about, around sort of, you know, being a venture investor and taking money from, um, you know, an investor, you know, these are true partnerships. So, um, you know, get to know the person on the other side of the table. Um, like a real human being. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, it, it may sound kind of like silly, but I think a lot of um, uh, people that are going out raising capital don't think about that way. And that, we, you know, this, this is a very kind of human um, type of um, um, sort of activity. And, uh, and then two, also, like, tell the truth. Um, many times you'll go through a process and you'll see someone kind of get caught in a lie or get cute or, or, or happen to mention an individual that, they have no idea that you actually know that you can easily fact check and one text away sort of validate whether they're saying it's correct or not. So just be authentic, be real, be yourself, and uh, and then the other sort of aspects of you know raising, I'm sure you know, I'll talk about as well. But that's something I feel like uh, people don't spend enough time thinking about. Great advice. I, look, I wrote I wrote a blog post about a dozen years ago called uh, was it the foxes and hedgehogs in Silicon Valley. And I don't know if you guys know about the fox and the hedgehog. It's Jim Collins, you know, in, in his book, Good to Great. He talks about these great companies and what distinguishes the great companies from the good companies. And the leadership is, by, by and large, uh, hedgehogs, which are, they don't have a lot of ideas. They have just one big idea. It's their life's mission. And that's what they do. And, and we're looking for hedgehogs, not the foxes who might be a serial entrepreneur. And they, you know, Elon Musk is a, unbelievable, exceptional entrepreneur. And so you could make money deal after deal after deal. We don't look to back Elon Musk. Like, I would have made a lot of money backing him, but that's not what we do. We look for the Sam Walton, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos, the guy that has one life's obsession mission. And that's what he's going to do until, like, they carry him out the door, you know? So that's what we're looking for. So those are really, really rare. And, you know, we, we tend to... Uh, gravitate towards certain kinds of personalities, or certain kinds of people. Okay, I have two quick ones. Uh, one is this thing I call the 30-second rule. So if you can imagine, we hear a lot of pitches, and if you sit down, you pretty much need to articulate what you do and why it's exciting in the first 30 seconds. If you're still going through your pitch and I'm confused on like what exactly you're doing, it's really hard to recover from that. And just generally, you should be able to explain to anybody in under a minute what it is you do and why it's a big market. And the second one is be a phenomenal storyteller. So I'll give you a little secret. When you, uh, you know, after you come pitch, let's say a VC, 
You really want them to walk out of the room with like the perfect sound bite that they can run over to their colleagues and say, hey, I just met the most incredible company. Here's what they do. Here's their traction. The team is amazing because of X, Y, and Z. So if you kind of think about what you want the investor to walk out with and what, they, what you want them to take away from the meeting, that's a really powerful thing to focus your pitch around because I can promise you, and I'm sure you guys do this too, with your companies that you're invested in, you're so excited, you can almost pitch the company as well as the founder, or maybe sometimes better. And uh, so just you know, really focus on telling the story in a way that whoever's listening to you is going to walk out of the room being totally fired up. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's all great advice. So. Um, I, we're about wrapped up uh, on, on the time. Just one final question for our panelists. Um, what is one trend uh, that you see that you're very excited about right now? It doesn't have to be international, just one technology trend. E-mobility. I mean, um, we're, we're doubling down both in a company called with Bird and also a company called Inboard. So uh, I think that's just going to transform the way people get around town. We have many investments around this particular thesis we have. I think we are living in a world that is more connected than ever before. Facebook's connected all of us, yeah, whoopee. But yet, we are all very lonely and, and disconnected from a sense of bigger, something bigger, right? Like we're sort of all collectively losing our souls. And so this connection to something, a community, something bigger than ourselves, is a huge problem, and we see it globally around the world. And the companies that are figuring out how to tap into that loneliness and how to solve that loneliness are doing very well. It will do very well for many years. I'm still very bullish on vertical SaaS. So this is software that's specific to a particular industry. Over the past couple of years, we've seen some incredible horizontal platforms, whether they're in communication or payments, that have really powered a lot of industries. But there are certain industries that still use pen and paper to do everything, whether it's construction, home maintenance, or healthcare, and a whole bunch of others. So I'm really excited about software that takes real deep domain expertise to build a mission critical product for those types of verticals. Great. Uh, so I think we have a few minutes. No? OK. No, no. Well, the panelists will be around for a bit. So please join me in thanking them for this awesome panel.